Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 117 of the podcast. It's the 28th of March, 2018, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. Anne Oman joins me to answer your questions. Anne is busy moving, and we wish her all the best. Now, this month, we dig into questions around meeting the needs of multiple children with diverse personalities and needs shifting and reconnecting with children after challenging times, shifting away from control as a parenting tool, and what to do about children who often interrupt. As a personal update, thanks so much for the reviews on my Unschooling Journey book. Thank you to Tara and Krish and Mama Mountain and Gina and Steve. Reviews are so valuable in the world of selling books, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts. (laughs) And oh my goodness, thank you so much, Tara, for uploading a picture of one of the coloring pages along with your review. I smiled so big when I saw it. And if you've emailed me lately, I just want to let you know that I see you. Things have been swirling and up in the air here, and I haven't had a moment yet to get back to you. I will. Just please be patient. And a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons and their generous support. It's vital to helping me share unschooling information and inspiration with anyone who wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week, I want to share a quote from the episode, a tidbit from Anne's answer about children interrupting adult conversations. As unschoolers, we need to truly see, respect, and celebrate our children. We can look deeper into each individual situation and see the perfect enthusiasm in our children. And then we get to decide if we want to allow that enthusiasm to grow or perhaps squash it by telling them that they need to learn to be polite and they can't speak until it's their turn. See, it's about seeing the situation through their eyes. It's not a rule, always let them interrupt. That is as unhelpful a rule as never let them interrupt. Day-to-day life isn't about rules. It's about understanding the complexities of that moment and seeing it In the context of the bigger picture, it's about treating children as whole human beings worthy of attention. And then what next step would you like to take? It was such an interesting question. Thanks so much, Alex. And there's a lot more to the answer, but I wanted to highlight that little bit. And now on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and I'm happy to be joined this month by Anne Oman. Hi, Anne. Hello. Hello. Just to let everyone know, Anna is busy moving this month, so we wish her all the best with that. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. And I am going to get a start- started this month. So question one is from Candace in Pittsburgh. Uh, she wrote... Hi, everyone. I'm loving listening to the podcast and really appreciate all of your voices and insight on this amazing unschooling journey. Quick background about me. I'm a part-time yoga teacher. I teach 12 classes a week, early mornings and some evenings. My husband works a regular 40-hour work week. I'm home with the kids during the bulk of their time awake. We have three kids, ages almost seven, five, and three. We just pulled them out of school at the end of their last school year, so the older two were in kindergarten and preschool. At first, we tried school at home, but that ended with power struggles, tears, and exhaustion. We are now fully unschooling and loving it, although I know that I have some more de-schooling work to do. I cannot say enough how unschooling helped every person in our family find connections to each other and ourselves. 
My oldest, Cordelia, is very outgoing and energetic. She lights up around other people and loves exploring the world. My five-year-old, Merrick, has social anxiety and is very mellow and introverted. He gets easily exhausted from brief, less than an hour, exposure to public settings. When he is home, he has a beautifully rich internal world. My three-year-old, Winifred, is very attached to me and asks for a lot of attention and does not nap. She is a lot of fun and is happy to do whatever her older two siblings are doing as long as I can hold her. Anyway, here's the question. How do I honor and meet the needs of all three of my children when I am the only one home? If we stay home, Cordelia is miserable. If we go out, Merrick is miserable. And if we go out for a brief outing and then at home I choose to have quiet time with Merrick to help him restore himself, Winifred physically fights him for my attention. Any ideas would be helpful. I feel like whatever I choose these days, I am betraying one of my kids' needs. They are pretty resilient, but I would like things to be a bit smoother, or at least know that they can smooth out in the near future. So, hi, Candace. <laughs> it's very nice to hear a little bit about your family. I love your kids' names. And so nice to hear that you guys are loving unschooling. And it does take me back, uh, reminding me of the challenge of having three young children, especially with widely differing needs and personalities. Um, so what occurred to me as I was going through your question was to really um, think about enlisting your kids' help in brainstorming some ideas with them, and then maybe later chatting with them about what might and might not work, and the other thing that can do is help them learn more about each other. You know, this isn't a let's have one conversation and and solve this, but the back and forth and the trying things is really a great way um, for them to start to learn a little bit about each other um, and to really feel like everybody's working together to try and come up with something where everybody's reasonably comfortable because that's the goal altogether. Um, now, there's the obvious um, splitting up when your husband is around, you know, so one of you can take Cordelia out to some fun place as well, and the other one stays home. Um, but for the main part, when you say you're home with the three of them, I was wondering, uh, are there some places that Merrick maybe finds less stressful that you could focus on going to? Uh, maybe places with less people, like the park, or places that are quieter, like the library. Um, the other thing that occurred, maybe he might enjoy some headphones while you guys are out so that he can be more in his own world, listening to his favorite music or his favorite stories. Um, even, you know, hanging out um, with you in a corner, if Cordelia's out and about like in, in the place, you know, so making, making a, a haven for him that he can bring with him wherever it is that you guys are going. And then for Cordelia at home, uh, what about the possibility of inviting other kids over to play at your house so she can have her engagement and Merrick can still be home? Uh, what kind of activities does she enjoy at home? Are you actively supporting those? So even if they take a little bit more time to set up, you know, maybe if she likes specific kinds of crafts or or um, specific games that maybe take a little bit to set up, um, just, you know, check in with yourself to see that you're using that energy to help her set up doing her most fun things when you guys are at home. And as you mentioned, if Winifred's big need right now is to be held, at least that's a need that you can meet wherever you are. <laughs> so, you know, things aren't going to go perfectly for everyone all the time. But as you chat with them about their ideas, as you try things out, see what happens, tweak things, you're all going to be learning more about each other's needs, each other's comfort zones, and you're going to be finding a, a path through it. And then soon, yes, definitely they'll be older. They're always growing and changing. It's just hard to see that day to day, but you're going to start to notice that a month down the line, two, three, etc. And what do you think? Well, in the growing and changing that you're talking about, yes, these might not be the issues, but they're always something. So that's why it's important to, um, you know, I, I always talk about the language that we're using to describe our lives. And I think that's uh, an important thing that we can look at here also. 
um, uh, see. Well, first of all, I had I, I, I asked Pam to do this question first, and then she stole all my answers. So I'm not going through <laughs> the stuff that. <laughs> And uh, backing up, uh, Candace, I love your descriptions of your children. Yes. It's clear that you see them and you celebrate them for being who they are. And I hear that you want to extend that into your everyday lives with honoring their needs and everything. And and the first thing I had on um, my notes was um, uh, how people tend to overlook the idea of having conversations with the children themselves, asking them for ideas, as Pam was talking about. And uh, with the thing about our brainstorming sessions that we would have, we, uh, you know, both the reasonable and bizarre options were um Ones that came up, we we would get silly with uh, solutions just to have any possibilities come up because it's in all those nooks and crannies where we find what really works when we just start saying anything that we have for ideas. So that was always fun to do. Um, As far as uh, the language you're using, your question itself, how do I honor and meet the needs of all three of my kids when I'm the only one at home? And I get that that's what it seems like you're needing to do. Uh, That question, though, to me feels like it's loaded with so much weight. It sounds like uh, to your kids needs not only need to be met at the same time and to the same degree, but in the same moment. And the responsibility of their happiness rests on your shoulders and your shoulders alone. And that does feel like a lot of weight. And I'm just, I'm somebody who just wants to, you know, look at ways to release any weight that we can. And a lot of it is found in our language. So if you look at this, uh, this, this thing doesn't always happen. They're not always um, needing to go out and or stay home or anything and to label them um, with the way they're going to respond if you do that. You know, it just seems like it's set, setting up expectations. And I understand this is a part of who they are and everything. But still, I, I think just seeing every case as individual um, helps with everything. Because as Pam was saying, you know, going out, there's so many different ways to go out. And staying home, there's so many other ways to go home. So um, just kind of removing the weight from the question, the scenario may lighten everything up and allow more possibilities to come in instead of labeling the situation and predicting your children's responses. Uh, Instead, allow possibilities in the situation and in your children. So... um, and anything that like we're suggest we're suggesting these possibilities and anything that you come up with, I would use these ideas to start talking to your children about, you know, say, you know, Pam suggests we might try this or whatever and just see what they think of that. That's how you start the conversation and get them involved in it. And that's that's really cool. Um, as far as the specific suggestions, your oldest loves to be with other people. Does she have friends that she could be going out with? Um, that does things outside that she's interested in also. Uh, Well, I was thinking you could plan something during the week for her to do on the weekends with either you or your husband, and then that's something to look forward to once the weekend comes. Or if there's something that she wants to do or someplace she wants to go, um, talk with them about, uh, Pam mentioned the uh, Merrick having music and stuff, and that's, you know, I've always done that with my oldest son uh, to kind of, um, yet built him a sanctuary to protect him from the things that overwhelm him because he's so highly sensitive and would pick up other people's energy. So we um, always had a bag ready for Jacob whenever we were going out. And the bag had a pad and pencil because he loved to draw. He had uh, the book he was currently reading, his Nintendo DS with Pokemon. Um, he would also carry touch touchstone things like he would find in nature that would make him feel good a rock from our river or an acorn or something and he'd have his music and his earphones as well or an audiobook so i'm seeing so many possibilities you know with allowing the needs of these siblings to be seen and honored and uh, part of that is just the energy of lifting it up from out of the weight where you're responsible for it all the time it's kind of spreading it out and uh and listing everybody's ideas in it uh and it sounds like winifred can feel happy if you're with her so i'm not sure how it happens that she's physically fighting merrick for your attention but <laughs> it feels to me like you can focus on merrick and join him in the things that help him to feel centered 
um, while also holding Winifred and helping her to feel connected to you by rubbing her back, um, playing little games with her, giving her snacky things, whatever. And if she likes to be in a sling, that's, you know, perfect. That's a good option also. Um, so again, their need for going out or staying home isn't, I'm sure it's not happening like all day, every day. So throughout your every day, you know, stay connected with them and involved in the things that they love to do throughout all every single day. Then when this issue does arise, um, it's easy to utilize your connection and talk to them about possibilities as, uh, Pam was saying, because you know each other so well from connecting throughout your normal every, everyday activities. So, uh, that's how you can go forward. And also for you to carry a yes energy, trusting that there's answers that will allow everyone to feel good. So, and it's in that space of your yes energy where, you know, ideas and possibilities will flow into your lives. So that's all I have to say about that. I think I love that, that point, the piece you had when you talked about um, equal and treating them as individuals. That, that mm-hmm. reminded me uh, the talk I have uh, called a family of individuals mm-hmm. and I'll link to that. But that whole idea that we can get so easily caught up, like that I need to treat them equally Mm-hmm. You know, that I need I need to be spending the same amount of time out with Cordelia that I'm spending in with Merrick. You know, that is right, is, right. is not a helpful thought. You know, it's right. not helpful. It's to more be comparing. weight. Yes, exactly. It's just more weight and expectation that exactly. I need to be doing this much with that this one likes and this much the same amount that this one likes. Right. Yeah, it's not it's, like that. The flow of your day is so much greater. <laughs> right. That's it. It's, I was going to say it makes everything small and it's the same with. Um, ha- having the expectations of how they're going to respond to the going out or the staying in. And that's limiting to them. You know, I, I who, who are we to say that our child always, you know, uh, gets anxious when they do this or whatever, because there may be the day when they don't. So that's what the conversations are about um, and the tools to help them. And one day they'll find that they don't need their Uh, their bag of stuff, you know, when they're out or whatever. So, you know, uh, that's what we always talk about the language. And we don't want language that's limiting possibilities, that's limiting our children's potential to be who they are. And that adds weight to what we already feel is a weighty situation. So Mm -hmm. beautiful. All right. So question number two is an anonymous question. And they write, hi, all. We are an unschooling family with two little kids, age two and four. We have been on this journey for a couple of years now, and having this podcast and de-schooling really helped us to get to a point where I felt like everything was going okay. However, we have had some really hard times with a job loss, an upcoming move, and just the stress of an uncertain future. My husband and I have been fighting a lot, and some of it has spilled over in front of the kids. I'm really ashamed to admit it, but they've seen some screaming matches. I've also been disconnected and spending a lot of time by myself while my husband handles them, which is fine, but I'm usually the primary caregiver, so their routine has gone for a toss as well. My husband and I are working hard to make up and work things out. We are also trying hard to not let the kids sense our tension. Any ideas on what would help make up for what they've already seen or heard? I feel like the overall atmosphere of our home is so stressed and so, so sad. What can I do? What can we do? Please help me. Oh, my goodness. Hello. You are in my heart. You are going through so much. And I know it's hard sometimes. I hear you. Uh, Life does that to all of us at times. And I'm sorry you're feeling so overwhelmed by it. Uh, personally, I think it's so important for you to allow yesterday to just be exactly where it is behind you. And the best thing I feel like you can do is go forward in a way that allows you to release the guilt about yesterday and to start building up feeling good about yourself again. So right now, know that everything that you feel was a mistake from your yesterdays are gone because you turned them into an opportunity to see more clearly and to do better next time. And that's really fantastic. Um, It's also important to be aware of how easily we can slip into thinking um, that the view of our entire life is stressed and sad in these challenging times. 
if we do the work to stay connected to even the smallest piece of light during these challenging times, then that sliver of light we let in can lead us to even more light. But our work is also to walk in the direction of that light. And I'm calling it our work because of how easy, as I said, it is to slip into feeling like everything is uh, downhill. So the work is to do the opposite, look for the light. Um, And another part of that work is to deliberately choose to connect with our children in their light. So how do you let light in when you're feeling so weighed down? Um, I pay attention to things that feel like gifts to me. Whatever it is that makes you feel good in any small way, give that to yourself and then fully receive that piece of feeling good as a gift just for you from the universe, because that's really exactly what it is. You can really look around at everything in your life and seek out things that are beautiful, that make you smile, that bring you a feeling of love and comfort. There are really so many of those things right in front of you every day. Wrap yourself up in a blanket and label that blanket as love and watch a funny show or movie with your kids. Notice that sliver of sun shining through the trees, coming down in a beam, or that bird that's singing its song on the porch so close to you, the soothing deliciousness of a cup of tea or a piece of your favorite chocolate. These are all just little gifts that are really just for you. They're pieces of light, and you can let them in and totally receive them. I often say out loud, I have received when I when I feel that uh, feeling and God, boy, just that allows the gift to touch my entire beingness. And after that up bubbles all of my appreciation, not only for the gift, but for all the other gifts in my life. So when you're a witness to something that's amazing and really it's usually simple, simply an everyday kind of amazing. These are the gifts that are just for you. Take them in, hold them in your heart, receive them fully and take note of your appreciation for them. Also, find ways to connect with your children in calm and gentle ways that are soothing. Uh, came to me maybe by some of those uh, wonderful coloring books that are everywhere now and glittery gel pens. Um, this is a gift for you, again. But invite your children in to do it with you if they want to. Rip out pages for each to color and sit around the table and color away and chat. Uh, I've always found it's easier to talk during those times, too, when the focus uh, is, you have this distraction, uh, this coloring thing to detract away from the weight of things you might want to talk about or say to them about everything that's going on. And maybe it's then when you're just hanging out by each other, happily coloring, you can apologize for how things have felt lately and maybe say, but this feels so good right now, doesn't it? I feel so happy right now being here with you. And it's this way that you include them in your quest to seek out the things that feel good and receive them as gifts. You know, if you point out that sliver of sunlight streaming through the trees to them, you're connecting with each other over these simple, everyday, yet amazing gifts in your lives. Your lives. And I've found that it's in the space where the challenges also seem to flow more easily. Maybe they loosen up uh, their reins on us a little bit. Um, lose some of their weight because you're not buried under the weight of feeling bad about yourself or your situations. Your focus is or, or your distraction of the weight of the thing, which is your focus, is on the things that make you feel good. And, you know, what a relief it is to feel like you don't have to carry the burden of difficult moments all of the time. That for the majority of the time you've been given these gifts um, that you're able to see more clearly now and share with your children. Pam? Ah, That was beautiful. And yes, definitely. I'm uh, sorry about the the challenges and the stress that you and and your husband are feeling now. It's, it is hard. And I know in stressful times, uh, my first instinct too, is to withdraw, to process what's going on. But each time I've realized um, that it's been so valuable to reconnect with my kids as soon as I can, you know, for them and for me as well. Because I've learned that when I'm alone, things often feel more overwhelming and more insurmountable. But my kids bring me back into the moment. 
back into life, um, back into those pieces of, of joy or those gifts that, that are all around us, but we um, have a hard time seeing. Um, it reminds me that things aren't as impossible as my fears had convinced me and that I can actually think more clearly now, you know, as, as Anne talks about it as that weight being released a bit um, and being able to see different possibilities now, um, different paths forward that we might be able to take um, with your kids. It's not about making up for what's happened. It's about moving forward from here, from where we are, from today in this moment. Because in relationships, things are going to happen in life that are disconnecting. It's the reconnecting that's so very important. And as Anne mentioned too, you can apologize. You can be with them. It doesn't need to be anything special. Coloring lego toys whatever they just need you around chatting with them playing with them doing the things that they enjoy with them reconnecting showing your love and support by being loving and supportive and by doing that it just helps us so much as well it gets us to a much better place where things aren't so overwhelming and and we can start to see that light right i know it's hard (laughs) (laughs) funny laugh because you know i we've all been through it and and it doesn't stop the flow exactly exactly it's the flow i mean uh As uh, we're recording it today, I posted a new post on my blog called The Nature of Time. Um, You know, the ups and downs and the ups again, you know, when you start to see the bigger picture, um, there is just a a flow of life to it. And, And there's valuable things that we learn about ourselves and about life and about our kids in those low moments as well. They're all parts uh, parts of our life. They're all meaningful parts of our life. Well, that's, yeah, that's how our growing, it's not yeah. that we need these challenges, but this is where yeah. we do a lot of our evolving. I mean, I, uh, I've gone through painful stuff this past year and thought it, things were the worst that I could ever face. And I came out the other side more me than I've ever been. And, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, that's, that's, uh, you know, part of the evolution and, uh, the yin and yang of, of life. And anyway, it's still hard, but that's why I focus on uh, the light because I know it's always there. I know it's always there. And when I get to the other side, it's brighter than ever before. Mm -hmm. Yes. All the best. Okay, question three is from Erica in Missouri. She writes, being raised in a standard power and control authoritarian model home, what functionally practical steps would you recommend to get started surrendering the illusion of control and practice honoring my children's autonomy? Specifically, what choices can I make when the urge to dominate and control monster where I become my authority model rears its ugly head? Did you face this? And if so, how did you deal with it? Thank you in advance. Love, future, unschooler, current, momster. Hi, Erica. That's that's momster with an M. M -M 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 -M
So you can use that urge to control as a clue to connect more deeply. Because not controlling our children is just one side of the equation. We want to replace it with connection. Or else you just end up with a vacuum, and that's where chaos brews. There's no connection. There's no control. It's just, it becomes craziness. And I also found it helpful to sit with my fears for a while so that I could learn more about myself. You know, that fear that was arising and starting to take hold. What did I really fear was going to happen? Why? Where did that come from? Was that maybe from societal messages that I'd absorbed? Were they experiences and messages from my own childhood? And do they make sense anymore? Do they make sense now? Why or why not? And just keep digging into that. So understanding myself better helped me release so many of those fears that I didn't even realize I was carrying around at first. And as I said, de-schooling is definitely a process. So give it lots of time and attention. And alongside that, focus on connecting with your kids and saying yes more. And you learn so much about yourself and about your kids. And then your days start to flow. And, and it all kind of grows out of that foundation. <laughs> and uh, hi, Erica. I feel like your awareness of your ability to slip into the controlling parenting role is really huge. And I've, that in itself is showing that you've come so far already in seeing that you don't want the tapes that you were brought up with to become the tapes that are in your children's heads. And that's really good. And I'm uh, Pam's, Pam went in depth, in depth, which is great because I'm just addressing the moment where, um, you know, your 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 parents' words are coming out of your mouth, and like you're saying, specifically, what choices can I make when the urge to dominate and control uh, come rears its ugly head? So, um, your awareness that you don't want to hand those tapes to your kids is the thing that is going to help you to just stop. That's the word that I'm working with. Pam worked with yes. I'm working with <laughs> with no. <laughs> um, because the your awareness and your just um, stopping is will allow you space between what is happening that is bringing up these automatic reactions in you and what you're calling the urge to dominate and control. When you're feeling that urge, picture a great big huge red stop button and you're going to be pressing that button. And the stop means in that moment, you just don't say or do anything because I know how deeply ingrained those words are and those tapes in our head. So when you don't when you're in that moment and you don't have time right then to do all the reflection that you need to do, hit that stop button. And that seems doable, don't you think? You don't have mm -hmm. to memorize steps to take. You just need to give yourself space because what you ultimately want um, is to feel good about yourself on the other side, right? I mean, yeah, there's a million reasons why you don't want to hand your children the old tapes that are in your head that seem to slip so e easily out of your mouth. And I say your mouth and I mean my mouth and everything. Everybody gets what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, if you think about it, you simply want to feel good about yourself and the choices you make in each moment. Because when you feel bad about yourself, you're living in regret. You're owning a lot of weight from what you handed to your children. And you basically, you know, you can't see anything clearly through the fog of feeling bad about yourself. So give yourself the gift of that stop button that you can press and just don't say anything until you've given it all some space. And as happens every time something is in my awareness, I was on Instagram and Karen Knox had a quote from Viktor Frankl, a uh, Holocaust survivor and author of the book Man's Search for Meaning, which as an aside is really cool. <laughs> That book was originally published under a German title, which translated to Nevertheless, Say Yes to Life. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Yeah. I love that. Anyway, the quote said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. 
Isn't that awesome? So That's give perfect. give yourself the gift of freedom, the freedom to continue to be who you are without adding the weight of regret onto your beingness because of something you said to your children that you didn't want to say. And then when you have given it that space, when you can look at your children in that space and truly see who they are, allow your heart to let down its guard. As Pam is saying, this is when, you know, you examine your fear that is making it come out. And honestly, uh, most of the time it might just be because it's all you know how to respond in the moment because of the tapes in your head. But that's when you can press the play button again. Once you've gathered yourself together and you can see your children shining, you know, maybe you want to simply share some information with them in that moment, but you've got to press that stop button and then get re- remove the tapes from your head, see what it is you really want to share with them and have it come out as information. That's it in a connecting way. Uh, maybe you've pivoted enough to join them in whatever it is you wanted to change and control. Uh, You know, most of all, make sure you don't hand them anything that will have them feeling bad about themselves or resentful of you, uh, because in the end, again, that would make you feel bad about yourself. And as Viktor Frankl said, in that space lies our growth and freedom. And I will add in that space, infinite possibilities for connection and joy with your children can be found. So allow for those possibilities to come to you with the space that the stop button creates. And if you've already said something, it's not too late. Hit that stop button still, but also hit the reset button. (laughs) Got a lot of buttons going on. It's so important to get comfortable with letting your kids know that you're sorry that old tapes came out of your mouth. I used to ask my kids if we could rewind that moment, and we would do that. We would, like, go backwards and everything to the place where it started, where the stupid thing came out of my mouth. And then I would respond again. And I would see them more clearly the second time around. And that would always be a beautiful lesson for all of us, uh, especially for my kids to see that, you know, adults make mistakes and they ask for a do-over. And so that must be an okay, cool thing for everybody to do. So that's it. Yeah, that uh, freedom, um, ability, whatever, to to just openly, like, admit, oops, you know. Yeah. made a mistake and, and move on from there. Yeah. It's so valuable for everyone, everyone to see because it, it releases that, you know, that fear we always have of being wrong. I know, you know, I well, and, grew and up thinking, and, and wanted to, yeah. And trying to yeah. keep up the facade that adults yeah. and parents know everything. I, 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 yeah. That's where most parents want to keep up that facade and it's just mm-hmm. not the truth. And then uh, there's, there's no, you know, it's, there's no resilience in that. There's no give, you know, give or take to that. There's no connecting with the other person. It's just the way it is. So, um, yeah, I love that. Love that. Okay. Question four is from Alex in France and Alex writes, hello. And first of all, let me thank you for your wonderful podcast, help, advice, and support. It is of great help and is a big source of pleasure for all parents who listen to them, I'm sure. I would like to hear your opinion about children who interrupt. My boys, five and seven, very often interrupt me and it annoys me a lot. When we are at home, it does not happen so often. But when we are in a restaurant at a doctor's office, it can happen very often and it is very, very annoying. I explained to them many times that they should wait for their turn and that it is not polite, but nothing helps. What can help me to sort out the situation in a positive and polite manner? Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Hi, Alex. I so appreciate your question because I come across the situation a lot in my library. Um, Most parents do believe what you are saying, that children should wait for their turn to speak and be polite. And when I have my story time day and there's parents and children everywhere, the library seems like it fills up with parents correcting children and parents trying to teach children lessons all the time. And the interrupting thing is one of the things. And I like to fill up my library with adults understanding and seeing and celebrating children. (laughs) (laughs) So let's look at that interrupting moment. You're talking to an adult and the child interrupts and most parents find that to be rude. This is how I see it. There being children who are bubbling over with excitement and enthusiasm about something they want to say or something that they need right at that moment. 
Not only are they bubbling with all of that, but they also want so badly to share that with you right then. I personally see that as a great gift from my children for them to want to share things with me. In fact, speaking of that, one of the greatest gifts of my life right now is my adult children knowing I am here for them no matter what. My 27-year-old son is going through a huge life change right now, and I can't tell you what a gift it is that he trusts me enough to know he can text me at any time with any thought, big or small, because they're all important, (laughs) or any report he has to do on how he's feeling, or to show me how he's arranging his room with 25 pictures, and (laughs) he knows that I will create space in my life for him in that moment, in case he needs a connection from me in that moment. Who's to say what they need? If they're asking for your attention, that lets me know that they need connection from me. So, uh, you know, my adult children are still excited to share with me all those things that are bubbling up in them as they are bubbling. And I'm not sure if there is a greater gift than that, really. And again, I'm going to talk about our language uh, because it plays a part in how we see things. Labeling this as children who interrupt discounts the child as a whole and all that is in them wanting to come out of them. And as unschoolers, we need to truly see, respect, and celebrate our children. We can look deeper into each individual situation and see the perfect enthusiasm in our children. And then we get to decide if we want to allow that enthusiasm to grow or perhaps squash it by telling them they need to learn to be polite and they can't speak until it's their turn. I really understand how hard that is. I've had to put my enthusiasm on hold at times, and it's very difficult for me, even as an adult, (laughs) (laughs) because I have so much enthusiasm for so many things. I am that person that annoys everybody else with my enthusiasm. And from what you're saying, it seems to me that your children are needing more of your loving attention when you're out doing things. And again, I so get that. They may be feeling disconnected when you're talking to other people and they're seeking some reassurance that you're there for them still. You know, if they're at the doctor's office, that's got a lot of uncomfortable feelings. And um, if you continue to simply see this as children interrupting and you feel like they should be polite and wait their turn, then you're turning off that switch in them that's wanting and desiring to connect with you. And to them, that might feel like you saying, no, I'm not here for you. I'm here for this person I'm talking to. So in a roundabout way, can you see how that might make them need even more reassurance that you're there for them and how it may cause them to just escalate the interrupting because they're feeling a bit off and insecure? Um, I've, always trusted the adult to whom I was speaking to be the one who is able to understand the concept of waiting because my child needs me, frankly. In fact, I might just say, uh, just one second, my child needs me. And then I'd go from there according to what the situation is. You know, if the child just says something quick, an observation or quick question, you can answer the child and then maybe touch the child, have some connection and touch, get down on the child's level, maybe put your arms around the child while you finish talking to the adult once the child has said what they wanted to say. If the child has something that's more involved, needs to explain something or needs an explanation of something and the adult maybe needs to get going, then you can quickly validate the child uh, And say something like, oh, yeah, I hear you. Let's talk about that in a minute so Dr. So-and-so can get on to his other patients. You know, then again, the connection with a child is important. Again, bring them in close to you maybe. Sit them on your lap, rub their back. Anything that lets them know that they are your priority and you are there for them. I looked up the word polite, uh, that thing that adults think children should be. And it means having or showing behavior that is respectful and considerate of other people. And respectful and considerate are like my favorite words when we're talking about the way we treat children. (laughs) And that's why my children grew up with an energy of those words. Everything they have felt or does the desire or need to say to me was received with respect and consideration. They learn to be respectful and considerate of other people when they are treated with respect and consideration. I have been around children whose voices have not been heard and their enthusiasm in the moment has been snuffed under the pretense of them being taught how to be patient and respect the adults who are talking. 
to me, it seems like these are the kids who have been given the message that whatever an adult has to say is more important than what a child has to say, and which, about which I disagree. And it's those children who not only continue to interrupt, but they learn that they need to actually start shouting loudly over others in order to be heard. So I have found that when you respect and consider the child's voice, then they are not insecure anymore. They know you're there. They hear you telling the adult that the child's voice matters to you. So they then, in their own time, learn to be patient and to not have to fight for a connection with you. They instead trust in that connection, then they know it will be there. And you can always help that by, you know, doing the things I was saying, touching them, letting them know that you're there. Pam? It's like like treating them polite, respectfully and considerately right there in that moment, showing them, right? Exactly. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and I love thinking of it as enthusiasm. That's really cool. So hi, Alex. I'm so glad that you're finding the podcast helpful. Um, and I think what comes out of that, too, is one of the first things to recognize or to remind yourself is that they aren't doing this to annoy you. Right. That is not their purpose at all. You know, that's what Anne was Anne was saying as well. They're trying to get your attention to help them meet their own needs, whether it's sharing something that they're enthusiastic about in the moment or getting your attention if they feel that they're not getting it. And as Anna is fond of saying, behaviors are expressions of need. So if if interrupting is the behavior that you're seeing, getting to the root of that would be figuring out what needs it is that they're trying to meet. Um, so one likely possibility that Anne mentioned is that they want to feel included, right? They, they are feeling a disconnection from you. And I think a shift in perspective might help. If you, what if you think of it when you take them places like restaurants and doctor's offices, um, that you think of it as showing them the world rather than just bringing them along to the things that you need to do. If you're going out with them and help them engage directly with the world as much as they want, it's a great way for them to gain experience and learn. You can include them as you go about your business. It's when they feel included in the interactions and the conversations going around them, they're participating. They're not interrupting. They're there with you. You're all there. Even if other people expect children to be seen and not heard, that doesn't mean you need to follow suit. You can be that mom who engages with her children in the world. Um, you know, I remember so many times at doctor's offices and even in the hospital redirecting conversations to include my children, especially when they're about my children, right? So often when you're out and about, even when, you know, what, what does your child want to eat at the restaurant or, you know, they're asking some medical question. They're asking the parent, even when the kid's right there. So bringing the child into the conversation, um, it, it, I think it helps so much. Definitely. And pe- definitely. And people were often surprised, right, to see children being exactly, treated as yeah. full participants right. in the conversation. But I don't really recall there ever being any pushback about it, right? Right. There, there was just surprise. And I found it was one of the ways to plant seeds just out and about in the world, that there's another way to be a parent and to be respectful and considerate of my child in that moment and to help them learn about the world and the ways to engage in it, you know, when they were wanting. If, if they didn't feel like talking, they weren't going to be interrupting anyway, and, and I would, uh, you know, answer for them or whatever. But it was their choice how involved they wanted to be, right? And there was just so much that came out of um, out of involving them when we were out and about in the world rather than trying to get them to, you know, sit quietly in the corner while I went about the business. <laughs> right. I was thinking another option is um, the briefing before you went oh, someplace. Yeah. And if, you know, if your time is very limited – uh, with the doctor and what was the other example that you said? restaurant okay restaurant what's interrupting about the restaurant <laughs> uh, give me an example Pam 
<laughs> I'm being just because maybe our, maybe our when you're trying to order our, our restaurant experience is just talking with the children and it's the waitress that interrupts <laughs> us the, the service yeah. that interrupts us so but anyway you know if you're going out and you're the person is in a hurry you could say you know we only have you know 10 minutes here um and I need to talk to this person about this much so um if you know if if you have anything to say to me, if it can wait till after that 10 minutes and give them an idea of, Mm -hmm. you know, just where you will be in your head if you are not accessible for them when they need you in any minute. So um, that's just one option. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and talking about it again after, right? The debriefing. debriefing, debriefing, (laughs) Debriefing, of course. Yeah. Oh, and that is the last question for this month. Thank you so much, Anne, for answering questions so with fun. me. So fun. So <laughs> fun. And just a reminder for everyone, there are links in the show notes for the things that we've mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the third book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Life Through the Lens of Unschooling. This book is a wide array of essays drawn from my blog that shed light on the day-to-day lives of unschooling families. You'll find essays tackling everything from learning to read to visiting relatives, all organized around nine keywords that have been woven into the fabric of our unschooling lives. De-schooling, learning, days, parenting, relationships, family, lifestyle, unconventional, and perspective. The theme is life, the lens, unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.